here at the spaceport that never sleeps, March was an incredibly busy time, but also a strange one as well. Because, well, work continues on the orbital launch mount. That's right. After more than a year of pause, activity has restarted at SpaceX's Starship facility at LC-39A. But that's not all. As what has become the standard here, SpaceX has continued pushing the boundaries when it comes to Falcon 9 launch cadence, Blue Origin continues work in preparation for New Glenn's first flight, and Relativity is making fast work of LC-16's expansion for Terran R. You all know the drill by now, so grab a headset and fasten your seatbelt. Max Evans with NSF, as per usual, I won't be alone today in exploring the rapidly changing landscape of, of America's premier spaceport today, as Alex and Adrian will also be joining us. So first, we'll hand it over to Alex to discuss what's happening over at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. As usual, Roberts Road is very busy with activity going on pretty much on every corner. One of the main Hangar X doors was open during the flyover, but sadly, nothing picking out of it. Yet. Right outside of Hangar X, there's a Falcon 9 booster getting ready for its next flight, and I really would like to know which one it is, but sadly, there are no easy identification marks on it. Falcon 9 boosters do have numbers on them, but they are really, really tiny, so it's kind of hard to see them. Let's go now to the Starship Tower sections, which I'm sure a lot of you are wondering what's up with them. Now, it's been a few months since we went over this whole tower section story, so let's recap what's going on here just in case you missed it. SpaceX is in the process of building a second launch tower at Starbase. That second Starbase launch tower appears to have nine sections just like the previous two. All but two of these nine tower sections were made right there at Roberts Road, and five of them have moved down to Port of Brownsville so far. Those five sections are one, two, three, six, and seven. Sections 8 and 9 were moved in parts and are now almost completely assembled at Starbase. So the two remaining at Roberts Road are sections 4 and 5. I do know numbers. <laughs> <laughs> to give a sense of perspective of where these are located relative to the hardware on the tower, well, section 5 is the one that houses the ship quick disconnect arm and section 4 just goes right underneath it. If you think that's a whole long story, well, that was just a summary. Now let's go to the changes. One thing we've seen is that at least over the last couple of flyovers, it looks like SpaceX teams have rearranged the floors and inner structure of these two tower sections to include stairs. On our last flyover, we saw SpaceX had removed beams and floor trusses on these two sections, and now beams and floor trusses are back, but they now allow for the tower sections to have their own stairs. These internal stairs were not included on the original Starbase tower, and in fact, SpaceX had to add them on the outside after the fact. We had a Starbase update episode with Jack doing a whole bit of them being star stairs and everything. We probably can link that somewhere. It's unclear when we'll see these two tower sections move to Starbase, but the stairs look to be almost entirely installed, so don't be surprised if they roll out unexpectedly one day. That is all our Starship Tower hardware here at Roberts Road, which are the chopsticks, carriage system, and the ship quick disconnect arm. No major work can be seen here compared to our last flyover, but the scaffolding is still visible on the chopsticks, so maybe the next flyover will check back and see what progress they've made. If we go south from here just a bit, we'll see SpaceX teams have started to put up the columns and beams for the north expansion of the Hangar X2 facility. If you remember from our last flyover, we explained this section of the facility will be part of the Starship Heat Shield production, often nicknamed the Bakery. I don't really eat heat shield tiles, by the way. Now, before I throw it to Adrian, I wanted to mention as well that the remains of B-1058 seem to have been dismantled over the last couple of flyovers. If you remember, B-1058 is the booster with a NASA worm logo on it, and it did its 19th flight in December of last year, and well, while the landing was okay, what was not okay was what happened after. On its trip back home, it tipped over, and yeah, the only remains that we saw was essentially the RP-1 tank and the engine section. Now, in our flyover in January, we saw those remains had been placed there next to Hangar X, essentially, and then a tent was placed over it by the time we last flew in February, probably to dismantle it while being covered from the elements. 
Within that tent, we could see part of the body of the tank, but the engines had already disappeared on February, and now on this latest flyover, it looks like there's even less remaining of that tank. Hopefully SpaceX is gathering lots of data from it, and its demise is not going to waste. Now over to Adrian. Just down south from SpaceX Roberts Road, we arrive at Blue Origins campus at Exploration Park. As we have mentioned in the past few flyovers, Blue has definitely been picking up the pace with New Glenn this year, as they aim for a maiden launch attempt in the next several months. To support this goal, as well as Blue's future ambitions, construction on new facilities is still ongoing. The largest of these facilities that is under construction is located on the south side of Blue's campus. As we've mentioned last time, permitting documents from August 2022 label this building as a composite assembly building. While we are unsure if this is still current, it's still shaping up to be another large addition to Blue's already impressive campus. The current area of land that has been cleared and is being prepared for foundations is different to the shape of the original proposed building, but we estimate this new area to be around 187,000 square feet, which is fairly close to the 193,000 square foot buildings in the documents. With more facilities on the way, this also means Blue may be bringing more employees and contractors on site. To support this, Blue is also working on adding a new parking garage just south of the main production building. Submitted in early March, the application for a permit states, the purpose of the North Campus parking garage is to provide sufficient parking for staff and visitors at the Blue Origin manufacturing complex. Planning documents attached to the application show the parking garage to cover approximately 140,500 square feet. Also mentioned in these documents is a 34,000 square foot office building which will be located just north of the parking garage. Ground preparations for this structure are already underway and we should continue to see it progress over time. Okay, enough of buildings for now. Time for some New Glenn talk. Following completing initial cryotesting at Launch Complex 36, Blue Origin rolled the New Glenn first stage back to the factory at Exploration Park on March 12th. This rollback will likely allow Blue to integrate the first stage with a new engine section, interstage, 7 BE4 engines and maybe even its aerosurfaces ahead of beginning its static fire campaign and possibly even flight. While there were no signs of this first stage while we flew, we did spot its transporter rig outside of the GS-1 integration facility located at the end of the warehouse. The transporter has been partially disassembled, likely just to save space as it measures around 80 meters long when fully assembled. However, we now know that once it's put back together, we should be close to seeing it transporting something out to the pad. Moving down to Blue Origin's Launch Complex 36, the first thing we can see is that the transporter erector we believe will be used to test New Glenn's second stages on the launch mount is vertical at the pad. In our last flyover, we noted that the structure had some scaffolding on it and was likely receiving work ahead of possible testing. In mid-March, the TE was rolled out to the pad on SPMTs and rotated into a vertical position. As of now, there isn't a stage on the TE, but maybe this could be a sign of that coming closer. Speaking of second stages, at the northern end of the launch complex, where Blue is working on developing tanks for their reusable upper stage program known as Clipper, it appears that the first two test tanks are now being scrapped. The latest tank that was tested almost a year ago is completely gone from this view and the original Jarvis tank is now missing its head, so it's likely that it will be gone before our next flight. Beyond the Jarvis tents, there are ongoing signs of activity at Launch Complex 12. While it's hard for us to get a good look at what's going on there due to trees and distance, it does appear that there has been a build-up of ground support equipment. Could this be to support further Jarvis testing? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Moving on to Relativity's Launch Complex 16. Clear conditions and great light during this flight allowed us some wonderful views of just how much work Relativity has done in the past few months as the pad is being upgraded to support the company's larger and more powerful Terran R rocket. It's likely that we'll see further but still rapid transformation of the area over the next several months as Relativity seems to be going full steam ahead for their next launch campaign. Over its like 37, ULA's final Delta IV Heavy rocket was back inside the MST, or Mobile Service Tower, following a scrubbed launch attempt of the NROL-70 mission on the day prior to our flight. There were some complications with the pump in the gaseous nitrogen pipeline, 
which provides pneumatic pressure to various launch vehicle systems. Repairs are underway, if not complete by now, and teams are working to lock in a new launch date here soon. But with this being the final Delta IV class rocket to ever fly, feel free to take your time. Just across the road from Blue Origins campus, expansion work is ongoing for Airbus OneWeb satellite manufacturing facility. Heavy machinery can be seen on site, and it appears that the footings for the building foundations are already in place for the 49,000 square foot expansion. Moving over to the Artemis hardware in the crawler yard, Mobile Launcher 1 is still hard down at LC-39B. It's worth noting that it's been sitting there for quite some time as it rolled out last August. Granted, it's been undergoing fit checks and repairs following the Artemis 1 mission, but that's been quite a while still. On the other hand, Mobile Launcher 2, or ML2, has seen a huge amount of progress in its construction. The base platform's main framework looks to be nearing completion. Once the platform is finished, it will be lifted and placed on four pedestals where it will reside until construction is finished and then rolled out to LC-39B for testing. But that won't be for a few more years now as ML2 was completely built and fitted for the SLS Block 2 launch vehicle. Moving right south from Launch Complex 39B is Launch Complex 39A, which you've probably heard has seen some more activity. The big news of the month is Starship's launch mount legs are going away at LC-39A. At the time of our flyover, only two remain upright, and as of this recording, only one is standing. I can, I can in fact see them on SCL. Look at that. There. You can see. Space goes live. 24-7. Watch it. And in fact, it was on a Space Coast Live where we saw the last leg coming down as we were editing. Uh, this is going rather fast. Now, we don't know what could be the reason for this, but lots of explanations are possible here. We can think of at least four main theories and all have a varying degree of optimism or pessimism. The most optimistic theory could be that the legs were wrong and are being taken down to put better ones. At least, I consider that very optimistic. Or it could be that they are being removed to put new ones that have a different design. Those are the two first theories, essentially. Since our last flyover, we saw also via satellite pictures that the overall launch mount ring had exited the Hangar M building at the Cape. Under these two more optimistic theories, then this ring will still be used and put on a new set of legs. These theories will sort of make sense as the foundations of this Starship launch but are not as strong as the ones now at Starbase. Those foundations at Starbase were changed right after the rock tornado produced during Starship's first flight to make the ground stronger, so... Launching from LC-39A without these improved foundations might not be the best of ideas. A less optimistic theory, but perhaps a little bit more realistic, will be that the whole Orion launch mount design is being redesigned and that the legs are being scrapped and the launch ring is also being scrapped. Under this theory, the launch tower, chopsticks and QD arm will remain the whole launch pad infrastructure, but the launch mount and whatever goes underneath it is being redesigned. On the farthest end of the pessimistic spectrum will be that the whole Starship pad is being scrapped. Who knows, right? It's not impossible to see SpaceX moving away from having Starship at LC-39A altogether. This one might be much more unlikely, but as mentioned, it's not impossible at all. What theory do you like better? Let us know in the comments below and, you know, maybe there's a fifth theory that we haven't thought, a sixth. I personally like theory number three, which is the one where the tower, chopsticks and QD arm remain, but the whole launch mount system is redesigned. Perhaps we'll see the return of the massive water-cooled flame diverter to 39A. Remember when SpaceX was building its first Starship orbital launch pad? No, that was not at Starbase, that was at LC-39A, and they started the work on that diverter in 2019, although work stopped about a year after. According to documentation released at the time, this diverter was going to be 20 meters wide and 20 meters tall, with a launch mount raised 30 meters off the ground. That's massive. Now moving over to the Falcon side of things, we can see there's no transport director at the pad. That's because it was inside the horizontal integration facility where a Falcon 9 was mated to it and rolled out for launch. That was the Eutelsat 36D mission. It launched successfully and now the pad is being prepared for its next flight in just a few days from now. lc 39 has been quite busy this March with four launches. That is the most launches it has hosted in a calendar month. SpaceX was able to break this launch pad's turnaround record twice in a row, so that speaks volumes as to how the activity is truly ramping up at this location. 
Over at the other SpaceX launch pad in Florida, Space Launch Complex 40, a similar thing can be seen going on. The transporter director is not outside precisely because a Falcon 9 is being integrated onto it for launch. The launch in particular was a Starlink 645 and as usual, it went without problems. Since our last flyover, we can see that the crew access tower has been painted black and white, just like the one at LC-39A. Also since our last flyover, this tower has finally been used. This use was in fact during the launch of the CRS-30 mission carrying a Dragon capsule to the ISS. But this also meant we saw fancy new footage of how the pad egress system works. This egress system will allow the flight and ground crews to evacuate the pad should something happen on the pad before it's time to activate the launch escape system on Dragon. I know some of my NSF colleagues would like to try that slide. I think I'm too scared to even try. One interesting addition we've noticed at Pad 40 is the construction of a wall near the Lucid Auction tank farm. We don't really know yet what it might be for, but I guess it's always good to protect your hardware from rocket launches, especially when they happen every four days. Now we've covered SpaceX launch assets, but what about recovery assets? Well, it was a really quiet day at Port Canaveral when we flew. No SpaceX drone ship, no ferry recovery vessels. One could have said this is what Port Canaveral looked like probably 10 years ago when SpaceX hadn't started drone ship landings. Except we can see the two Dragon recovery vessels and also Falcon 9 booster B1078 in port, so I guess not. Now, this booster was part of a regular recovery time that SpaceX recovery teams were able to pull off. Let's go by the numbers. This booster supported the launch of a Starlink 646 on March 25th at 7.42 p.m. Eastern. It landed about 8 minutes later at 7.50 p.m. Eastern on a SpaceX's drone ship, a shore full of Gravitas. Recovery teams then chained the Signet Warhorse 3 tug to the drone ship and towed it back to Port Canaveral. This happened at an average speed of 7 knots with peak speeds of 11 knots at some points in the trip. On March 27th at 9.50 p.m. Eastern, 50 hours after landing, Beaton 78 entered Port Canaveral. A record time. I actually pointed this out on social media and Kiko Donchev, SpaceX's Vice President of Launch, replied emphasizing this key role of the recovery teams in driving the launch cadence. The faster the recovery, the faster SpaceX can launch every Falcon 9 rocket. With Starship activity starting to pick back up at LC-39A, when do you think those changes are going to be finished? And, more critically, when do you think Starship will finally make its first launch attempt here in Florida? Feel free to let us know in the comments, as speculation around this topic has always been fascinating. Thanks so much for joining us today, everybody, and we hope to see you again soon for our very next flight. I'm Max Evans for NSF. Peace out, Girl Scouts.